Now the question is, could we have predicted that obesity rates were going to rise if we increase carbohydrate consumption? And who was the first person ever to say that carbohydrates might make us fat? And again, you have to read the literature to understand. And this was the guy who was the first person, Jean Antelm Brillant Savarin, was the first person in 1825. He wrote this book and he made comments about what makes you fat in a diet. Okay, so this is now going back to 1820 on. The second principal cause of obesity lies in the starches and flowers which man uses as the base of his daily nourishment. As we've already stated, all animals who live on farinaceous, that's starchy foods, high carbohydrate foods, grow fat whether they will or not. Man follows the common rule. Man follows the common rule, written in 1820. Starch produces this effect more quickly and surely when it is used with sugar. And then this is just a warning for those who enjoy their beer. Yeast flour is no less fattening when it is absorbed in such drinks as beer. The people who drink them habitually are the ones who develop the most marvelous bellies. And certain families in Paris who drank beer in 1817 for economy's sake because wine was very dear, is that an advert for wine, then found themselves repaid by added weight which they now find quite unwelcome. So if we were honest, we have to acknowledge that we understood that carbohydrates can cause obesity and we knew about it in the 1820s. And all farmers know that if you want to feed an animal naked fat, you give it farinaceous or starchy foods. Then we come to the book that is the basis for all these arguments that we have. It's Banting's book. And Banting was the man who in 1850, uh, 1862 was put on the low carbohydrate, high fat diet. For the, He was the first person who reports his experience. And this is the book that he wrote at the time. And it became very famous. And the point of that is to establish that the Banting diet, which we promote, has been around since 1862. It is not a fad diet. It has been discounted as a fad diet. It was the original diet, as I will show to you. And it has stood the test of time. A fad is one that disappears. This has never gone out of pop, out of. Uh, popularity since then and I showed it was the first medical diet prescribed in 1890 so how can we discount this as unorthodox and novel and so on and a fad it's not it was the original diet so in the book Banting writes the following for the sake of argument and illustration I will presume that certain articles of ordinary diet however beneficial youth in youth are prejudicial in advanced age the items from which I was advised to abstain as much as possible by my physician, Dr. Harvey, were bread, right? Butter and milk was wrong. Butter, well, butter's fine. Milk's got quite a lot of carbohydrates, which, which they didn't, un butter they didn't understand is a high fat product. He didn't understand that. Sugar, beer, and potatoes. These said my excellent advisor contained starch and saccharin matter tending to create fat and should be avoided altogether. And then he made an, an incredible observation and he said, and I'll have to explain it to you. I can now confidently say that the quantity of the diet, in other words, the number of calories you eat, may be safely left to the natural appetite. So he was saying that if you eat the right foods, the quantity is, well, you don't have to measure it. It will naturally, you will choose the right number of calories to eat. And I'll show you how that works. And that it's the quality only which is essential to bait and cure corpulence. So if you're eating a high quality diet, as I will describe later, you don't have to worry about counting the calories because that's not the way you regulate your weight. Now, the problem with the, the diet was that in fact it got confused in Britain because the scientists came along and said, Dr. Harvey, you prescribed this diet for banting. How does it work? And he couldn't explain it. How could you explain? I mean, this was 1860. And he decided it was because it had a high protein content and he changed the diet to become increased high protein. And Banting said, but it doesn't work, Dr. Harvey. And so they went down the wrong route. But there was a German called Dr. Epstein. And again, I show you this picture because this is a personal copy of the book that I search for these books and I find them because I want to read what did the guy actually say. And this is the German version, but I had got, I also found an English version. And Wilhelm Epstein is really interesting because he was a cardiologist, described a condition called Epstein's anomaly. And the connection to Cape Town is Epstein's anomaly. The first person ever to correct Epstein's anomaly was 
Christian Bonner, Professor Bonner, who'd influenced my interest in, in medicine. So there's a link for me through Epstein and, and, and Barnard. But Epstein said it's the high fat diet that's important and he took this diet to Europe and it became the standard diet as I'll show for obesity. And this is what Epstein said, this property of fat to produce satiety more rapidly, to diminish the cravings for food and abate the feelings of thirst, facilitates to an extraordinary degree the introduction of the modified diet. And that is the key to the whole debate, is that you, if you're hungry, you're going to be fat. You have to regulate hunger. And the only way you can regulate hunger is by increasing the fat intake. And there he describes it in 1883. The, the permission to enjoy certain things, always, of course, in moderation, as, for instance, salmon, high fat, pâté de foie gras, which, by the way, is produced by making ducks eat carbohydrates, not fat. Very important point, because we're going to come to the fatty liver. What causes the fatty liver? It's carbohydrates, not fat. And such like delicacies reconcile the corpulent gourmet to his other sacrifices which consist in the exclusion of carbohydrates, sugar, sweets of all kinds, potatoes, and every form I forbid unconditionally. So that was the, the, Bantin, the Epstein diet. Peace. And I'm not going to go through it because I've made my point. I've, my point is that this diet was established in 1852. It was taken to Europe by Epstein. Epstein describes the high-fat diet in his book, fully described there. And where does it go to next? It goes next to another book, the most, one of the most important textbooks in medicine, never peer-reviewed by Sir William Oslop, one, probably one of the most famous physicians of all time, who wrote this textbook in 1892. And in the textbook, he describes the following. This is in the diet for the treatment of obesity. Many plans, now please understand, this is the, he was the god of medicine in 1892. So this was the conventional advice in 1892. And he didn't get sent before the HBCSA for writing this. Many plans are now advised for the reduction of fat, the most important of which are those of Banting, Epstein and Ortel. So there he lists Banting and Epstein. And then he gets the wrong, the, the Banting story was wrong. Well, I've explained it because Harvey got it wrong and it said it's high protein. Because he said now fats are excluded, but that was not the original band how Harvey diet. But let's move on. Epstein recommends the use of fat and the rapid exclusion of the carbohydrates. Farinaceous, i.e. carbohydrate containing in all starchy foods, should be reduced to a minimum. Sugar, sugar should be entirely prohibited. A moderate amount of fats for the reason given by Epstein should be allowed. So that's what the textbook said in 1892. That was conventional standard advice for the management of obesity. And obesity is, as I'll show, a condition of insulin resistance. So if I'd been a medical doctor in 1892 and I'd said you must eat carbohydrates, I would have been giving unconventional advice. So we move on. Many plans are now advised for the reduction of, sorry, uh, maybe it seems to me like I've repeated the slide, sorry. So then I'm gonna finish up with uh, which is something I just discovered last week or two weeks ago again because this is why Twitter is so fantastic. You get people tweeting this stuff. And someone tweeted this article. This is the review of the Dietary Gold of the United States in the Lancet, April 23rd, 1977. It's really pertinent because it shows an Englishman writing this in the Lancet is indicating that as far as he was concerned, people were wrong to believe that high carbohydrate diets caused obesity. But what he was saying was, that must have been the standard opinion of the day. So let's read that. So the, the new guidelines, the goal one of these new dietary guidelines is to increase the carbohydrate consumption, but consumption between 55 and 60% of the energy intake. Then he says, the committee shows its professionalism. He is praising the committee by stating with what should be increased to compensate for the reductions in take entailed by the other five goals because they had to reduce the fat so you have to replace it with something so you can replace it with carbohydrate the first goal which was to increase the carbohydrate consumption will surprise those and then he says one hopes few of them are medical people because medical people know everything so they couldn't be wrong who still imagine 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 imagining that starchy foods are unhealthy or that bread and potatoes are especially fattening so that tells us in 1977, this guy writing thought he was incredibly clever because he knew that carbohydrates were not fattening. 
but other people might think it was fattening. And so I, I say, perhaps time has proved those, one hopes few of them are medical, to have been correct. They were correct, because the carbohydrates were fattening. And so I finished by saying, actually, bread and potatoes are especially fattening. So those, my point is that in 1977, the argument was, or the belief was, that carbohydrates were fattening. That was a prevailing belief, but it had to be health washed, as I said yesterday. Because it, if you're going to take fat out the diet, you have to health wash whatever you put in its place. And if it's polyunsaturated fatty acids or carbohydrates, they have to be health washed. And I will argue that much of our current medical issues are related to the increased consumption of carbohydrates, particularly refined carbohydrates and sugar, that was the direct consequence of these dietary guidelines.